Over the last 190 years, Canal Winchester has flourished because of the twin industries of agriculture and transportation. The rich soil allowed farmers to grow excess grain to sell, and the canal brought passengers, freight, and a means to transport grain to market. Canal Winchester's residents and businesses evolved as railways and eventually U.S. Route 33 replaced the canal. T.S. Trim Industries, one of our largest employers for the last 30 years, has contributed more than jobs to our growing city. The land our fire station 182 sits on today was donated by the company back in 1996. Part of our business plan is to um, give back to the community. So every year when we establish our business plan for the next key, what we call our business year, uh, we actually have goals in our plan where HR and all, all sections are responsible to donate money or to different causes. Canal Winchester, named Ohio's fastest growing city in 2017, attracted an influx of businesses to the area who found it a welcoming community to live and work. It's been so fun. And, and we, in general, um, really believe in having a relationship with the community. There's, there's not a lot of times we'll say no to anything that's going to help support Canal. We've, we've donated um, big pots of, of brisket French onion soup to the local food kitchens. And, and we've done some really fun things and by far exceeded our expectations for, for what we thought of a small town. Two of our newest businesses are owned by veterans who enlisted right after 9-11. They came to the community in different ways, but decided Canal Winchester would be where they live, raise a family, and start a business. So before opening my salon here in Canal, I was um, a booth rent stylist, so mostly predominantly in the Dublin area. Um, I bought a home here in Canal right before the pandemic started um, in January, and we loved Canal so much that I decided to step away from booth renting and open my own salon here. This community is much more about family, right? We're, we're families together, um, they do things together, and they take care of each other. And so it made Grease Monkey decide that this is the right place. This is a place to help build the community, to take the community to a level where it deserves to be. And that's how we ended up here. Canal Winchester Chamber is committing to welcoming and supporting businesses through not only changes in our city, but through the business environment evolution as well. The Chamber is important to the community and local businesses. Um, we try to be, I think, for lack of a better word, a liaison between the community, our membership, and even our elected officials. We're always listening. We're listening to what the community has to say, we're listening to what our membership has to say, and then we're taking what we hear to our city leadership, but we're also listening to what they have to say. And the current environment is tough. With supply chain and staffing challenges, please remember to be kind to the ones who showed up to keep you going. The Canal Winchester Chamber, powered by people. Welcome everyone to Meet the Candidate Night, and um, I'd like to start off by thanking BrewDog for allowing us to use the space. Um, it's always a, a benefit to have a company like this in our community. Um, I'd also like to thank all of you for being here and for submitting your questions. Um, we received many questions. Uh, we tried to compile those. A lot of them were similar in nature. Um, I want to thank Corey Rally from Yellowwood Farms. She took that list and she uh, got it down to about 15 questions for us tonight. Uh, don't know if we'll get through all of them. Uh, hopefully we will. The candidates will have 90 seconds to respond to each question. Um, they will go in a random order. Uh, and lastly, I want to thank all of our candidates for being here tonight. Uh, Patrick Shea, Laurie Amick, Jill Amos, Chuck Carpenter, Ashley Ward, Brandon Horde, and Chloe Green. 
and we will get started right away because we do have a lot of questions. The first question tonight, what steps will you initiate to ensure the community is fully engaged in this election? And first to answer is Chuck Carpenter. Thank you very much and thank you for uh, showing up tonight in uh, supporting this uh, endeavor to uh, find out a little bit more about all of us uh, candidates that's running for uh, city council. Uh, the question was what steps will you initiate to ensure the community is fully engaged in this election? Well, I'm going to be going door to door and try to get the homeowners uh, endorsement for their vote for me on November 2nd. But we'll also encourage them to get out and vote um, not only for me, but as a city council person, but for the passing of the Canal Winchester Charter. Uh, that is, will be on the ballot this uh, November 2nd. And I think that's very important that uh, the city and the residents know as much as they can about what the city charter says and, and what it stands for. I will also encourage them to uh, and to uh, send to Congress. So I think and the charter. local issues to engage going door to door I have created postcards that I'm handing out and I've been posting on social media so residents know where I stand on the different local issues Brandon good evening first I would just like to thank the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event I would also like to thank all the candidates for making it here tonight and to all the residents who showed up to attend in the middle of COVID still ongoing. So thank you everyone for that. In order to get voters engaged, uh, you have to meet voters where they're at. And for me, that means going door to door. That means making posts on social media and really just engaging with voters. Local issues are some of the most important issues um, on the ballot every year. Um, local candidates will impact residents' lives more directly than a lot of federal and state issues will. So I think it's really important for me and the candidates to get out into the public and really engage with all of you through conversation. And also I intend to follow up with all of my supporters who have my, who I have their phone number or email with get out the vote efforts to make sure that voters are showing up to the polls. Thanks. Only 90 seconds? Just kidding. Um, first again, thank you everybody for being here. This year, as Ashley said, it's a very important year for us to get out and, and change what's going on in our community. It's our chance to take a stand. So I plan to continue door knocking. I too have invested in some nice lovely postcards which I will decorate your front doorsteps with very soon. But the other thing that's very important is we have got to get, we have a lot of new residents. We need to educate them on where the polling places are. We need to educate them that there is transportation to the polls. So I'm going to do what I do best, and that's talk. And I talk a lot. So I plan on visiting a lot of residents, and then I also host community coffee, and we'll continue talking until we get heard. Chloe Green. Good evening. The best thing that I can do is to touch voters wherever I can. That means not only communicating through social media, but also while I'm out going door to door canvassing, also at community events, visiting local businesses, and even worshiping at church. Thank you. Patrick Shea. Thank you everybody for being here. My strategy for voter engagement is quite simple. I'm gonna meet voters wherever I'm at. Whether I'm having breakfast at the wigwam, I'm having lunch at Harvest Moon. I'm having dinner at Shades. That's where I'm going to talk to people while I'm there. When I'm at my children's soccer games, when I'm at football games, and then when I'm also going door to door 
to speak to people about what's going on in the community, what my beliefs are about the community, why I feel that way, and why it's important. So hopefully I'll get to meet you all as I'm going around town and knocking on doors. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I'd like to thank the Chamber for hosting tonight's event, thank my family and friends and my walking billboards up here, and my fellow candidates, and I wish them the best of luck. So one of the things we need to do for this election is encourage voter turnout. Um, there aren't a, a, a huge number of issues on the ballot this year, and we need to encourage people to get out and vote because this election has the greatest impact on them locally. The second thing, like my fellow candidates also said, I'm already beating the pavement. I went out and met with a lot of people yesterday, um, which was difficult considering the Bengals, the Browns, and the Steelers were all playing yesterday. But I got to talk to a lot of amazing residents, and so I'm really glad that I had that opportunity to meet and greet people. Thank you. Thank you all. Next question. Do you believe we have a crime issue in Canal Winchester? If so, explain how to fix the problem. If not, cite your reason. First to answer, Patrick Shea. Well, I think if you're paying attention, yeah, there's a little bit of a crime problem going on presently in Canal Winchester. Um, my neighbor's vehicle was stolen out of his driveway a couple weeks ago. That's something that wouldn't have happened five or ten years ago. But the challenge is, is that Columbus is coming. We live in a county that's got the 13th biggest city in the country, and we're going to need to have a strategy for how we combat crime as it increases and the population increases. One of the things that I come to think of is I've talked to Sergeant Walker, who is in charge of our sheriff's department here in town. Presently, if you look at our biggest offender for police calls and police dispatches, it happens to be Walmart. There were 295 calls to Walmart for our police department or our sheriff's department between January 1 and August 10th. So I asked Sergeant Walker, I said, Sergeant Walker, why is this? And she said, well, it's really quite simple. We're sitting ducks, we're an easy target. That's how the criminals look at us. Because every Walmart that's in the city of Columbus is required to have special duty officer, in stores, present. That's a nice deterrent to shoplifting, which leads to other crimes. So if Canal Winchester is known as easy pickings, all we're doing is inviting more crime. Therefore, we need to make changes to the way we do our policing structure and encourage and possibly legislate folks who are leading our dispatch calls to have special duty officers on site so that we can drive down instances of crime rather than driving them up. Thank you. Brandon Ford. Like Patrick said, I also agree that we have seen an increase in crime in Canal Winchester. I don't think Canal has a particularly high crime rate compared to comparable uh, cities, but I do think that as a result of Columbus sprawl heading out this way, we're facing more and more of the problems that Columbus suburbs face. So I do think that we do have increasing crime, and I do think that residents legitimately feel anxiety about that. Funny, well, not funny enough, but my neighbor also had their car stolen out of their driveway a couple months ago. It seems to be, <laughs> it seems to be the thing to do these days for criminals, I guess, to steal cars, break into garages, a lot of petty theft going on. So I think the solution to that first, and city council is already starting to take steps in this direction, what is to do the research. You'll hear that theme from me a lot tonight. I really love research and data, and I think we need to engage an objective third party to look at different policing solutions, whether that, that includes things like making sure our police force is right sized, but also looking at is Fairfield County the best option? We have, there's Madison Township, there's starting our own police department. I think we need to look at all of those options and I think we need to have the cost for that so residents can be informed to make the right decision. I'm not committed to any decision today, but I do think the research needs to be done and residents armed with that information, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry for the tall people. I have to keep moving the mic down. Um, I had the um, pleasure of attending a council meeting 
uh, several weeks ago where the, Frank the Fairfield County Sheriff's Department sent uh, Chief Collins and his lieutenant to talk with council uh, about uh, their, their services. And one of the things I did not hear from them was a trend in increase in crime. They did say they are seeing some uh, higher than normal narcotics incidents. That's concerning and should be concerning uh, to all of us. Um, I have always, I'm a 20 year resident in Canal Winchester and I have always felt safe here. I have never personally been the victim of a crime in Canal Winchester. I walk at night. I've never been scared uh, in any way, shape or form. However, a few weeks ago, my husband and I woke up to leave for church and wouldn't you know that our truck sitting in our driveway parked up close to our garage had been ransacked. And um, the joke was on the criminal because if they were looking for cash, my husband had a penny on the floorboard of his car. So they didn't really get anything, but it was disturbing to me that someone would be so brazen as to come up into my driveway onto my private property and open a vehicle and go through our belongings. Um, we'll talk a little bit probably tonight about whether or not Canal would uh, warrant it, a need for their own police department. And honestly and truly, I'm with Brandon. I would have to say the data needs to support it. Um, if I'm a taxpayer, I need to know what I'm getting for my additional tax dollars. Thank you. I mean, we're not Chicago, right? Um, but there have been increasing theft. Um, there have been car break-ins and people's cars have been rifled through. And people aren't feeling as safe as they used to. So our city needs to do something about it. I believe a thorough alternatives analysis needs to be conducted that evaluates different options for improving safety. Two of those options would be Canal Winchester having its own police force and also funding additional positions with the Fairfield County Sheriff's Office. We need to do a cost benefit analysis of each of these alternatives and then take that information to the residents and solicit their feedback on what they would like to do. And then we need to take action. And let's not forget about traffic safety. Recently, there was an incident where a school bus was rear-ended by a semi-truck. Traffic safety is another issue that we need to evaluate and identify potential solutions. Thank you. Sure, people problems. <clears throat> okay, so the question was the police. Last year, my husband and I had our car broken into as well. As a matter of fact, pretty much our entire street did. But after talking with Sergeant Walker, she did say that it's comparable to a lot of neighborhoods around us. Does that make it okay? No, not really. I have the benefit of already serving on council, so I can tell you since my term started, we have added, we, well, we've already added at least one, and we have two additional starting here very soon, so we have a detective and another deputy starting. We've also started the process of evaluating, which we did ask for about a year ago. Um, we've started the process of evaluating the police force, whether we have, what we have is enough, whether there's more that we need to take care of, um, what do we need to do? Are we in a good position? We also need to make sure that Madison Township, because all of you pay taxes to them, that they are being held responsible for serving our community as well and not just select groups. We've worked so hard to get the communication with them more tightly put together, but we need to make sure that we're getting our money's worth out of Madison Township. Our Fairfield County Sheriffs are running ragged. We're trying to make sure that they have the coverage that they need, but let's make sure we're getting our money's worth from all the departments that we have. Thank you. Green. <laughs> Sorry, I've got to put it up a little bit higher. When it comes to crime in Canal Winchester, I find it to be not that much different than many other places around the country. But one of the things that I believe that we can do is proactively explore the possibility of us having our own small scale police force, even if it's one or two cars. We can also encourage our residents to be vigilant, to lock your doors. Although that may not stop a burglar who would break a window in a heartbeat, but it would have them stop for a second 
or installing ring camera systems or different camera systems, investing in our properties and protecting our homes. I'm a new homeowner this year, and that's the first thing I did was get a security system, an alarm system to protect myself, not only because I am a young woman, just because I know we live in a crazy world, and it would be crazy for me to not want to protect myself. And I love the city of Canal Winchester, and I know us to be a family home, but we have outsiders who live among us and who come in among us, and they don't have a respect for our property. But also, we need to advise other people to be watchful and to look out for each other. That's what neighboring is. You look out for one another, and that's what I truly believe that Canal Winchester is a city of. Neighbors looking out for neighbors. People looking out. People being up late at night. I live in a wonderful community, a wonderful neighborhood currently where my neighbors, they look out for me. They let me know if my garage door is still up at 7 o'clock. They come over and say, hey, can you close your garage? And I do so. And that's my time. Thank you. <laughs> I believe we do have a crime issue, but unfortunately, it's like every other city in Ohio and then probably in the United States. I don't think we're any worse or any better than uh, some of those other communities. We have had our fair share of crime with break-ins and retail thefts, and even I work at the golf course part-time, and we even had a break-in at the golf course, uh, a couple break-ins actually at the golf course, and they've stole some vehicles and things of that nature. So obviously, we'd be uh, fooling ourselves if we tried to deny that we had a crime or a uh, crime problem. <clears throat> uh, that is why the city, though, is working with the Fairfield County uh, Sheriff Department and adding additional uh, patrolmen and adding a detective uh, to get assigned to the Canal Winchester. And also, I want to point out that the Fairfield County uh, Sheriff's Department has the same people working here all the time, so it is similar to having your own police department without the added additional expense, which would probably be about $20 million, roughly, to start your own police department. I will say that I think that perception is worse though than the reality because unfortunately um, there's a lot of social media going on and I think a lot of those people either belong to the uh, Canal Winchester School District or has a Canal Winchester mailing address, but unfortunately they are in Columbus. But again, that gets tied to the Canal Winchester uh, crime issue. So I, I do support the um, uh, putting together a plan or a, a plan of action and doing a uh, task force study to, for both the Fairfield County Sheriff Department and the uh, Madison Township Police Department. Thank you. Next question. What is your viewpoint on the City of Canal Winchester taking a more active role in providing our youth with services? How do you anticipate keeping families engaged? Uh, first up, Brandon Horn. I completely support the city taking more steps to keep youth involved in the community. Um, at the last city council meeting, they talked about expanding the Canal Winchester Joint Recreational District, and I know that's been in the plans for quite some time. I'll let Jill talk more about that when she's up here. But I think that with McGill Park being built and the new recreational fields coming with that, I think the expanding access to these programs for youth is really important for the city to, to lead. And, and we see a lot of this crime, it connects to that, being done by teenagers. And I think that expanding programming for youth helps cut down on that crime and helps keep uh, youth busy. I also like that CWJRD is also going to potentially create programs for adults so that adults can also engage in sports or artistic endeavors with um, our peers. So as a young adult, I'm excited to see that, you know, maybe adult volleyball programs that me and my wife could do or things of that nature. So I think it'll be really cool to see how CWJRD continues to expand. It's a great resource that we have and I fully support continuing to fund that and see how that goes. Thanks. Green. The city of Canal Winchester could take on a more active role for our families by continuing to invest in our schools and building out new facilities for our kids. I anticipate on keeping families engaged by ensuring that families are aware of current services that our city does have to offer and also researching other services or businesses that might be beneficial to come to our city. Chuck Carpenter. 
I've attended uh, only one meeting of the CWJRD and have looked at some of their financials that were sent to me before the meeting. This organization needs a lot of help. And uh, according to their financials that were sent to me by their people, uh, they were projected to lose $88,000 in the year 2020 and 2021, which is very unacceptable uh, in anybody's book, I would uh, hope to think. Uh, from talking to a few of the parents, <clears throat> they think this organization is not very well run, and that is why there is very little engagement from the community involving into the uh, CWJRD. Uh, I would make sure that uh, I know that they've come to the city to ask for some additional funds for a director, but I would make sure that the CWJRD budget show a payback for hiring an $80,000 a year uh, director. Uh, <clears throat> and also, uh, plus their current employee, that would be about 58% of a budget of about $215,000. Uh, if that seems excessive again to me, the only way that they could do that is the city to take a more active role or possibly even taking over the whole organization. So, thank you. Ashley Moore. I think it would be great for the city to take a more active role in providing our youth with services. Research has found that participating in extracurricular activities can improve resilience, self-esteem, and social competence while decreasing the likelihood of drug and alcohol abuse. This issue is really important to me. I have three kids who participate in the Canal Winchester Joint Rec District sports, um, soccer and swimming, and a husband who's a Cub Scout DIN leader. And I will say that our experience has been very positive so far. Um, but one thing I've noticed is that we're always begging for parent volunteers to be coaches or to be DIN leaders. So one thing I'd like to look into is ways to incentivize parent involvement. I've also heard from a couple of parents that finances can be a barrier to participation. And I know that there are programs available and in place to help with that, but I'd like to learn more about that and explore if maybe that needs expanded or just advertised more. Maybe parents aren't aware of that. Um, lastly, I would love to expand options. I think it would be really very cool to have a science program, and that's something I would personally love to be involved with. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So I've been in Canal Winchester for 20 years. And in that time, I cannot honestly recall a city-sponsored or city-promoted event for our teenagers. And that's where I think a lot of the issues are coming from. We have teenagers that are bored, they're unchallenged, they want activities. Now, if you're in the school system, if you're an administrator or a teacher or a guidance counselor, you might think that's what the schools are for, but the schools, not every child is going to engage or connect in extracurricular activities associated with their schools. So we need to let the kids speak. We need to hear from the kids. What do you want? What is Canal lacking? What kinds of activities do you want to be involved in? And we need, as adults, and our responsibility to them is to be able to create forums and places for them to go and conduct these activities. Jill Amos. I serve on the JRD, and Mr. Carpenter's information is quite mis miscued, but I'm not going to waste my 90 seconds on that, but I would be more than happy to share with you the correct information if anybody ever wants to know. Just so you know, about two years ago prior to COVID, the JRD started a plan called P for P. And while that name annoyed the crap out of Will Bennett, because I kept saying P for P and P for P, it stood for Plan for Progress. And what the Plan for Progress was, was a way for the JRD to start developing more programs. Right now we house youth. We service 33% of the school population. That's not enough. Some of these kids don't play sports because they can't afford it. Some of these kids don't play sports because they're not aware that it even exists. I can't tell you how many times I get, where can my kids sign up for this? They have no idea we exist. So we started a plan for progress and then COVID hit. But our plan was, to not only teach these kids sports, but to finally get to the students who aren't athletes, who love science, who love art, and then figure out a way to get them engaged in our community. 
When my son graduated high school, my oldest, they had fight club after school. The kids would all find a yard and they would fight in it, and that was fun. And now we have dangerous TikTok challenges, and that's fun. That's not fun. Destroys our community, destroys our town. Let's get on board for a plan for progress that will make the JRD a better program for all of us. So I've been here 18 years. I've raised my daughters here. They participated in the uh, joint recreation organization. That's what the shirt I pulled out of the dresser last night when I coached soccer many years ago said because that was the first evolution of the joint recreation district. Now we have the joint recreation district and it does a nice job. I also officiated for the swimming team because they needed somebody who had a knowledge of the swimming. Volunteers make up the essential backbone of what it is. The challenge is is that We've gone from a city, a town, a village of 3,000 to a city with a population of over 10,000 now. We have more people, more demand. We also have more revenue coming in, and there's no excuse for the city not to be funding a joint recreation district with a recreation director. We are one of two cities in Ohio, if I'm correct, and I might be wrong, that still funds their recreation department solely on user fees. It's Canal Winchester and the city of Bell Fountain. So I, if I'm elected to council, one of my priorities, because I have children, is going to make sure that we fund a joint recreation district with a director who's going to drive growth, and then we're going to have metrics and KPIs that we expect them to deliver to help do the growth and bring kids in. I got to say, the ideas about arts and sciences is great. I think we need to throw in like a fishing clinic, because we've got a great creek where all the kids discovered last year during COVID, because they were all down there swimming. And why not with the fight club? Let's get a boxing instructor in here. Let's teach these kids how to box and maybe we'll have less problems and less shootings because they're duking it out. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, this next question is a mouthful, so here we go. Please describe any social, business, family, and or similar relationships you have to any current elected or appointed city office holders and our principles in industrial, commercial, retail, or similar development projects that have or may become before council. And first to answer, Ashley Ward. Hi. Uh, well, I, I don't think I have any of that. <laughs> um, but I do work for a state agency. And so I would need to recuse myself from any matter pending before that agency. And that means abstaining from voting as well as discussion. And this would primarily come up with issues um, regarding our wastewater treatment plant and water treatment plant. Um, other than that, I have no conflicts of interest uh, for any of those things that were named. Um, I'm not associated with anybody currently working for the city and um, I have no ties to any developer. And additionally, I am funding my campaign myself. Uh, this will enable me to be completely independent. And um, I won't owe anybody any favors, and my vote will belong to the Canal Winchester residents. Jill Amos. I serve on the Canal Winchester Historical Board. Um, therefore, sometimes I do work with a lot of the local businesses because they are also part of the historical board. Outside of council, I am friends with two council members, Mr. Bennett and Mr. Lynch. Um, I've known Mr. Bennett since PTO days at elementary school, so we go a little far back. Uh, Mr. Lynch I met probably 10 years ago uh, during a parade, actually. So that would be my extenuating. I, too, am paying for my own campaign because I believe it's important for me to represent um, the community, and I want to make sure that I do that all on my own dime because I chose to run for you. Thank you. In the spirit of transparency, I would like to advise you that I think that I do have a small conflict of interest. I currently sit and serve as the vice chair for Canal Winchester Human Services. 
and Councilman Milliken is our liaison to the city and to City Council, and Councilman Kuhlman also sits um, on our Board of Trustees. At any point, um, the, ci the city does provide some funding to our cause, and that money is spread across multiple programs for Canal Winchester Human Services. At any point that an issue would come before Council that involves Canal Winchester Human Services and requires a vote, I would definitely abstain and withhold my vote for that uh, particular conversation. I was born and raised here in Canal Winchester, so yes, I have many old friends and new friends uh, here in various positions. I have known Mike Mayer, the Ebert, the Mike Mayer, <laughs> Mayor Mike Ebert, since we were six years old in first grade. Uh, back then, we didn't know that we would be, you know, possibly running as mayor and council person. Uh, my wife Jean and I bowled with Mike and Carolyn uh, 50 years ago. Uh, I do not view this as a conflict of interest, though. I do find the question somewhat offensive for all of us, and it is insinuating that we would vote for who we know versus what we know. I will say and vote what I feel is the proper decision on any given issue for Canal Winchester residents. So I'm trying to think through this. Um, I know a lot of people in town. I know a lot of business owners. I've been a business owner in town for 15 years. Uh, we built a property in the industrial park in 2013. So doing that, I had to work with the development director, the planning people, the permits people, the plans people. Um, does that give me a conflict? No, because once I was done building it, the only time I see them is when the abatement committee comes through to look at our building and make sure that we're doing what we said we were doing and producing the jobs that we said that we were going to produce. In terms of relationships, uh, let's see here. I live down the street from Jill Amos. Um, I live down, I've known Pat Lynch for 20 years. I've known, uh, I live down the street from Mike Walker. I live down the street from Will Bennett. Um, so yeah, I know a lot of different people. Does that put me into a position of conflict? No, I think the only time I would get into a position of conflict is if it was specifically addressing a property that I had financial interest in. And at that point, I would absolutely abstain because I have no business voting on that because that would be a clear conflict of interest. Chloe Green. I don't have any interest that may cause any conflicts that I am aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon Moore. I also do not have any conflicts of interest that I am aware of. I, over the course of the last six, seven months, I have been attending a lot of council and zoning meetings, and I have gotten to know many of the council members and the city employees as acquaintances. But as a newer resident, I actually think that that's one of my biggest strengths is that if elected, I'll bring a fresh perspective and an objective set of eyes to the issues the city faces. So, thank you. Thank you all. Next question. How would you describe the current path of development in and around our city? Please specifically note your opinions surrounding warehouse development. Uh, first up, Lori Amick. So I get the softball. <laughs> um, first of all, the path of development that the city is on, um, what I am not seeing as a resident, I'm not seeing a whole lot of innovation. I see a lot of the same old, same old, and um, honestly and truly, cities that don't have a diversified plan going forward, they're not going to survive. I think about cities along the Ohio River that were once thriving areas and their lack of diversified planning probably turned them into ruins. Um, so um, what's, what's at the core of everything right now is technology. I have a background in technology. I'm a huge proponent of technology. It runs the world. I don't think anyone would dispute that. And so what are we doing to attract technology companies into our market? 
With respect to the warehouse, this is a toughie because I really honestly and truly understand both sides of the argument. I understand the tax abatement issues. I understand the income tax revenue that it can be that can be generated. I understand the, the school uh, and the uh, idea that the school may get some money and some funding from it. But I also understand the cons. The residents are saying, please stop. Please stop developing, not necessarily all warehouses, but let's pause and think about where we put them. Warehouses are not something that you can easily change. You cannot tear down a warehouse because you get tired of it or because you can't find an occupant. I got a lot more to say on this topic, so I'll hold my time. <laughs> So presently we're standing in a light manufacturing, light industrial manufacturing building that received an abatement that I don't think anyone in this town is going to argue unless you're upset about the fireworks on occasion has been bad for town. It's generated tremendous traffic, tremendous jobs on the income tax from labor that works here and then also additionally property taxes that are coming from the abatement. In addition to that, my office is in the industrial park. Across the street from me is the NIFCO warehouse that they built and I think they spent $7 million to do that. That's quite an investment. There's a lot of jobs that happen over there. In addition to that, you have NIFCO's North American headquarters located in Canal Winchester. I don't know if any of you folks have ever been back in the industrial park, Canal, Coin Canal Point Industrial Park. Uh, it's a beautiful development. Everything is extremely regulated, very clean. When it comes to warehouses, I think I have a little bit of a better understanding than most folks because I run four warehouses in two states. I've worked with economic development people in two states on warehousing projects. Do I think warehouses are bad? No. Do I think that mistakes have been made with the development of warehouses in this town? Yeah, I think there's some room for improvement. Whoever decided to put them behind Kroger and not have a traffic plan, well, I actually went and told Lucas that was absolute shit and he probably should have done a better job about it. He told me that he's waiting on ODOT to give him money to get to Grove Porter up to Bixby. But the truth of the matter is, is that's an absolute disaster. What happens on the north side of 33, I think that's a little bit of a better area. I'm finished. Brandon Moore. I think economic development in Canal Winchester has been aimless, somewhat driftless, and without a comprehensive plan, we haven't had the proper leverage to get the development we need. Where I cut my teeth on economic development was on the Tenby Equities Warehouse that went in south of Win that was approved south of Winchester Boulevard. There was a forest there that was standing for over 100 years. Um, in 2019, with no pressure at all, we decided to remove woodland protections from that woods, which would have preserved it. Two years later, we could not stop the removal of those trees. They were bulldozed to make room for another warehouse. I called several city departments. Uh, I talked to Dick Miller, the urban forester. I talked to Lucas, our development director. I talked to Andrew in zoning, and I got kind of rung around in a lot of ways. There was a lot of conflicting information. And the biggest thing I felt is we really need this comprehensive plan. Where the city does have leverage, we're giving it up for nothing. And where we don't have leverage, we're just kind of letting whatever happens. When we pass this comprehensive plan, we're going to provide Lucas and the city with the proper leverage to attract development that we want. And yes, warehousing and logistics is a part of the future here, but it can't be the only part. We do not want Canal Winchester to become an industrial town. So let's find a plan that involves tech, industry, more restaurants, office space, and, and a balanced approach to development catered to a value-centered comprehensive plan. Thank you. The current path of development in and around our city is in need of a comprehensive plan. The days of piecemealing things together is simply unacceptable. Providing jobs is good, but I don't support Canal Winchester becoming a warehouse district. We should incentivize development from big to small and invest in jobs that aren't just limited to huge warehouse facilities. Thank you. Jill Amos. <clears throat> 15%. That's what we were told the other night at our council meeting is we have about 15%. Compared to other cities, 
That's quite a bit, believe it or not. It doesn't sound like it, but 15% is a lot. When I tell people about Canal Point, which I think Lucas laid out incredibly well, I do. It's kind of hidden off a of Diley Road. Most people have no idea it exists. You're not familiar with the number of large warehouses back there or the fact that one of the leading um, companies has a development center that's top notch in bringing in people from around the world. You're not aware. It's hidden. The traffic comes at the same time every single day, just like it does in areas, but it's well thought out, well planned, and it's outside of our little area, and it kind of worked well. And that's what we need to see. If we're going to develop, we've got to develop smart. And so after I've talked with all the residents, and I keep talking with all the residents, the big common factor is cart before the horse. So we look at our traffic study and we look at all the warehouses that are tentatively scheduled to, approve, to be approved. There's going to be some development. We all know this. It's finding a way to not only develop smartly, to not be intrusive to our residents, but to also make sure we're covering the transportation thoroughfare. Make sure that we're getting all the things taken care of in the city and maybe painting pigs for Trish Preston. <laughs> Well, I'm in full support of the city council and elected officials on the decisions that they made on the current warehouses, especially the ones that have been built. Uh, I wouldn't second guess them um, as I didn't have all the information that they had in front of them when they voted unanimously uh, to uh, build those warehouses. I have no problem with the current direction uh, versus <clears throat> some of the alternatives that I've heard. Greater Columbus, uh, is planning on building, it was in a, a magazine that a good friend of mine from the Steel Working Union uh, plans on building 15 million square feet of warehouses in the greater Columbus area. And I think Canal Winchester should cash in on some of that 15 million square feet because I think it is gonna generate enough, enough revenue to offset some of the issues that we've talked about. I would want, not want housing or apartment buildings in there because again, that's gonna put a burden on the school system. I do believe, though, that the current warehouses are not being developed in a haphazard, unplanned method. I think there has been a lot of thought put together by the city council and by the city officials uh, to put them where they have been put. I do believe, though, that the state does need to catch up with uh, development along, all along 33, not just in Canal Winchester, and they need to start at 270 and work all the way down to at least Lancaster and possibly all the way down to uh, Athens. Uh, they need to improve the access on and off of 33, obviously, uh, and they do, uh, we do need to continue to work with the state to put pressure on them and uh, work with them, though, to make uh, those things happen. I think we're doing fine with residential growth. I personally like low density, slow growth that our school system can keep up with. I would describe commercial development as haphazard. BrewDog was great. The warehouses behind Kroger that received 15 year tax abatements were terrible. The proposals for four additional warehouses that planning and zoning recently voted against recommending are also terrible. Warehouses have few jobs per square foot, an issue that will be exasperated by increasing warehouse automation. Additional truck traffic means more congestion, more safety concerns, again, a semi-truck recently rear-ended a school bus, and more wear and tear on our roads. To be clear, I'm against additional warehouses. Local economies are strongest when there's a diverse mixture of different types of businesses, including local businesses. We need a development plan and a city planner to facilitate this, and we can do it. Columbus is the fastest growing city in the Midwest and Canal Winchester has a lot to offer. We just need to dream a little bit bigger and plan a lot better. Thank you all. How much weight do you believe residents' opinions should be given when shaping the development plan? Um, first to speak, Jill Amos. Did I mention I love to talk? 
We host monthly meetings called Community Coffee. We started those a few years ago. Not everybody was on board with it, but the whole point was to engage residents. We bring you in on a Saturday, we give you pastries and coffee, but the important thing is so many good things have come out of there. That's where I learn what my residents feel. That's where you're more comfortable saying things to me that you may not have said at a council meeting. Some people don't want to talk in public, never want to talk in public. Half of us up here would probably not want to talk in public. Uh, but I believe that if we don't get our residents' opinions on something that involves them, on who we represent, then what are we doing exactly? Shouldn't our residents have a good portion of the input on what's going to happen over the 20 year plan? You all pay taxes, you live here, you eat here, your kids go to school here. Shouldn't you have part of the opinion on what's going on? Why should you let just seven people decide what your future is? We're here to represent you and if we're given the opportunity to bring you in and make you part of this process, it's a definite must for me. Thank you. <laughs> the residents' opinions should absolutely be taken in full measure. Uh, the challenge is, is how do we get the full measure of residents' opinions when so many folks are busy? You get so many folks that are working, running from work to picking up kids to soccer games or to football games or to practice or to church class, and it becomes a challenge for those that care about the community to show up at public forums because they have prior commitments. So what I think we need to do is emulate the strategy that was used when developing McGill Park, which was surveys sent out to residents. Presently, the city already has a database of every resident because you get a water bill from the city. So my last water bill had all of the Canal Winchester notes, the schedule and such, and I think that's a great way to communicate with it. Furthermore, I think we should start to capture resident emails and start to survey them via email and we capture that via the water department and at that point you can get a quicker grasp and a quicker poll on what residents want and don't want for their city and their development plan. Chuck well obviously there should be a considerable amount of weight given to all the residents of Canal Winchester. Uh, I do not believe, though, more weight should be given to the ones that voice their opinion louder than most of the residents. I have attended several council meetings with the same people stating the council is not listening to them. I believe it might be the other way around. <clears throat> I think the city and council has publicized the process, their votes, and their opinions, and those individuals are not listening to the council members either. I think that if uh, we were to... Um, get everybody involved by going to have neighborhood meetings. As all the candidates have said, we're trying to encourage people to get involved when we knock on the doors to get our, endorsed by their votes. Uh, I think that it would be uh, who of us to get as many opinions as possible, no matter what means that is. But it doesn't make one group right or wrong. It just shows we have different viewpoints, which I think is what makes uh, the us have elections every so often is so like if you don't like the viewpoint of the people that are in there then you vote them out so that's my opinion I do think that engaging residents is a key part of the comprehensive planning process but I really think that all stakeholders should be equally involved at the table including local businesses um, places of worship nonprofits like the Chamber of Commerce, Destination Canal, um, and the various city government offices for it to be, and the Sheriff's Office as well. For it to be a truly successful comprehensive plan, we do need extensive resident feedback, but we really need all stakeholders to be involved in that process. And not just through surveys, which I do think is a good idea, but also through established steering committees that are made up of diverse components from various areas of the city that are inclusive and representative of the city. So I think if we do that, we'll make sure that the residents' interests are represented in the comprehensive planning process. Thank you. Paul 
I absolutely believe that the residents should have a voice in shaping the development plan. Residents pay taxes and do business in Canal Winchester. They should always play a role in any decision that ultimately affects them. I'll be short on this one. Uh, how much weight should be given to residents' opinions on the development plan? A lot of weight. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to take our residents' opinions into account. The very first step to developing the development plan should be to ask our residents what they want our city to look like long term. And I do agree that local businesses and other groups should also be included as part of that process. And then it's up to city leaders to hire experts to get us to where we want to go. Thank you. Of course, this is a no brainer for me. You must include the input of our residents. They are taxpayers. They pay the salaries of city leaders, whether it's council members or the city, the people who are actually employed by the city. What I do think it is very important is to get diversified input from many. Um, the other thing that I think is really, really critical is until I started becoming very engaged a couple of years ago in community coffees and whatnot, I was totally uh, undereducated about issues around annexation and zoning, property owner rights, what you can and cannot do. What does the city, what is the city able to control and what are they not? I think there's a huge aspect to educating um, our residents about what are the limits there. So again, I think that uh, you want to get the input of residents, businesses, even farmers. We're a farming and agriculture community. We need to get the input of many people so that we can make the best decisions and the most diversified decisions going forward. Okay, we are, the, the question how, Will you influence speaking and considering residents' input in all phases of the de development plan? We feel like all of you answered that within that question, so we're going to move on. <laughs> Did you have something? I didn't. Know. So, I okay. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll, we'll go. We'll go. We'll, we'll go for it then. So thank you all. And then the question will be: How will you influence seeking and considering residents' input in all phases of the development plan? Chloe Green will be first. <laughs> I would take an all hands on deck strategy. It means everything from in person and virtual town halls, surveys, and even canvassing across Canal to make sure that residents feel that they have a stake in the direction our city is headed. In fact, in my recent mailing, I asked the residents in Canal Winchester their opinions on major issues affecting them. Not only did I send the questionnaire, but I also sent a return envelope so that residents could communicate with me their concerns for the future of our city. Thank you. First of all, we have to make sure they're aware of the opportunity to do so. Um, if they are not aware that a particular issue or subject or decision needs to be made, how can they provide their input if they don't even know that there's a topic on the table to be discussed? Um, I think back to one example, the Charter Commission. Um, each council member, as I understand it, was um, given the opportunity to create a, or appoint or solicit a particular representative, but you can be rest assured that those appointees or those people who were asked to serve on the Charter Commission aligned to the beliefs of the sitting council, city council person. So um, I guess I would ask that um, we make sure that the community knows uh, that there is an issue where we want their opinion and feedback because as I walk around and talk to residents, I'm uh, a little disappointed about how misinformed they are about issues facing our city. I think in order to get residents engaged and involved in this planning process, we need to meet residents where they are at. And that involves a holistic solution to communication. And yes, that includes social media and online communication as well, but it also includes 
uh, physical posting, talking to your neighbors, just spreading the word. But I think it's v very vital that we meet residents where they're at. I, I hear a lot of times being a millennial is, you know, why aren't younger people involved? Well, we have to engage young people where they're at um, to make sure that they have a stake in this process as well. Same with newer residents, because especially for the younger residents, we have the most to gain or lose from this process just by the sheer fact that we'll be here for a very long time. So I do think it's important to make sure that we are engaging residents of all demographics where they're at. Thank you. A few weeks ago, I attended a meeting that was supposed to provide the public an opportunity to comment on the development plan. Over 30 people showed up and city council gave us 19 minutes to provide input, a combined total, and that was a hard 19 minutes. It was unacceptable. I would push for another public meeting where anyone who wanted to speak on this very important issue would have the time to do so. I also think a survey is a great idea to send a survey to every resident asking what their vision, their long-term vision for Canal Winchester is, because not everybody can make it to the public meetings. I also would like to see a citizens group or committee be formed that can really get into the weeds of the development plan and provide recommendations. And then after that plan is crafted, it's really important to give citizens the opportunity to review it and have another round of input. Thank you. So I'm a big believer in the KISS principle, and just keeping it simple. Everybody, everybody in Canal Winchester who receives water service from the city gets a water bill from the city. If you're still on a well, you probably shouldn't be because unless you got a good RO system. That being said, it's very simple. You have the address of every homeowner, every resident, and you slide in a survey with the water bill. They're going to open the water bill because they're going to pay it or they're going to get their water shut off, and you ask them for their opinion. If they choose to engage, they choose to engage. If they choose not to engage, that's their choice also. Thank you. Chuck Carpenter. I will encourage uh, people to get engaged uh, <clears throat> by knocking on the doors and when I'm seeking their uh, endorsement to get involved with the community development plan because I think the community development plan is a very important instrument uh, going forward um, to let everybody know where we have a direction of where we want to be in 10, 15, 20 years from now uh, and keep that as a living document uh, because again things have a way of changing pretty rapidly uh, in today's climate. Uh, I would also have, encourage them to get uh, attend the, the city planning and zoning commissions, the city uh, council meetings, uh, submitting their views on the city website, which they have an opportunity to do. And also, I think that it would behoove the uh, city council and maybe some of the uh, city uh, personnel to organize neighborhood gatherings so that, again, we can meet them in their neighborhoods and in their uh, place where they are. So. Council is not a job that you just do on a Monday. Every other Monday, you don't just show up, serve your two, three, four, five hours, and then go home. You have to be willing to meet the community where they are. So one of the big things is that we have to get the word out. I agree wholeheartedly with Ashley. The night that we invited our public, we have said time and time again, people don't show up. Not me saying this. People don't show up. People don't show up. They showed up. I voted no to close the meeting for a reason. I didn't agree. People showed up to talk and we shut them down and that should have never happened. We need to, we have phone numbers. We should be making those group phone calls that blast everybody in the city. We should have multiple meetings. We're all busy. We have kids, we have jobs, we have all sorts of things in our lives. There should be multiple chances for residents to come in. When they come in, let's sit down, small groups, start talking to them, see where they can most, best, best benefit us. Maybe they work in development, maybe they work in agriculture, maybe they work in technology. What can they bring to the table to help us expand on what we're trying to do with the city? 
but we have to, as council members, also be willing to sit there and talk with them. If we're going to meet them where they are, let's have the conversations where they are and find out what can they bring to us. We have a person sitting in here that serves on another commission, has been a wealth of information. That doesn't even affect our city necessarily, but it does. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Uh, next question. How much experience do you have reviewing legal and architectural documents? First to speak, Chuck Carpenter. Kind of goofed me up. I got the questions out of order here than what was given to me, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, throughout my career of uh, being a small business owner, I've had, uh, I've had two small businesses. I've had to review and go over a lot of legal documents. Uh, I'm not a lawyer by any means, uh, and I believe that's why we have legal counsel that we would uh, lean on fairly heavily uh, <clears throat> and use their expertise uh, if there's any questions in my mind. Uh, one of my jobs was working with a family um, run property management company. So for the um, architectural documents, we had to build and remodel homes and businesses. So I have, I'm somewhat familiar with the architectural drawings. Uh, again, not an expert in it by any means, uh, but again, I would not be hesitant to ask any questions of the people that have that knowledge. So, thank you. Jill Amos. I will not lie, this is probably my weakest section. I'm not an architect. I love Architectural Digest. I love to read it and study homes, but I could not tell you necessarily an architectural thing about them. Um, in my previous life, I did do contracts for a living. I do read a lot of them. A lot of it is redundant. You will love reading them, and if you ever want to do it together, that's fine. Um, but this is where you as a council member, it's your job to pick up the phone and find out. I have lots of resources that I have called and said, what does this mean? How do I interpret this? What exactly is this saying to me and how does it affect me? This is where if you don't understand, you have to do the due diligence of calling somebody or looking it up or figuring it out and not just going into the meeting blind and accepting everything that's given to you. You have to have and be able to do some of the research so that you can ask the questions and understand what you're looking at. Thank you. This is a question I was excited to get because I've spent the last nine years working in compliance and risk management and audit. Um, five years I was a compliance manager at Fremont Federal Credit Union and then since I've moved down here I've worked at Kemba Financial Credit Union. Every day I dive deep into federal and state regulations, laws, procedures, Reg C, Reg D, right, you know, TRID, HUMDA. All, all of these documents are very detailed and in depth. And I, I, I enjoy, I don't just, I'm not just good at it. I enjoy sitting down with a nice long packet, <laughs> sifting through it. And in the months I've been attending city council meetings, I've seen how often city council gets bombarded with very complex documents from planning and zoning, from all these different departments and I like sitting there and going through them and the devil's in the details they say and you have to at least have a basic understanding on how to sift through these and bring a critical objective eye to those documents because there's a lot of good info in there so yeah I definitely have experience with legal documents architecture I do not have experience in blueprints and things of that nature but as several of the other candidates suggested nobody can know it all and that's why we have expert subject matter experts in many different areas that we can ask for advice. And I'm not going to sit up here and be arrogant enough to say I know everything, but that's why we have a lot of people we can consult. So but when it comes to legal things, give me some regulations and documents. Love that stuff. Thanks. <laughs> I have a lot of experience reviewing technical documents and legal documents. Um, so I am a chemical engineer, and uh, part of my work is reviewing engineering reports and diagrams, as well as many, many, too many <laughs> um, legal, legal documents. Sorry to any attorneys out there. Um, I also have experience uh, revising rules in the Ohio Administrative Code, as well as providing input to legislatures on bills that have been passed into law. 
So while I don't love it quite as much as Brandon does, um, I am extremely comfortable and proficient at reviewing both technical and legal documents. Believe it or not, I'm with Brandon. This is one of my most favorite things to do. Um, I have been involved, uh, or I've spent most of my adult life in corporate America, and during my tenure in corporate America, I have been involved extensively in the creation, review, uh, negotiation, and approval process of many countless multi-million dollar contracts. Um, I find it to be um, exciting. I find it to be um, very revealing about what the person who is offering you their services is willing to negotiate on. I've been involved from the forefront, so you have to know what, it, what are the must-haves, what are the non-negotiables, what are the things that you're not willing to bend on, and then you go to the negotiation table, and I always keep that ace in my pocket so that I'm prepared to uh, pull out that negotiation card whenever needed. So they call it practicing law for a reason. And if you've ever dealt with an attorney, well, I think so, but it could go this way or that way or this way or that way. I've looked and signed enough contracts in my life to understand legal documents. And every time I ask my attorney, well, what does this mean? They go, well, it could mean this or it could mean that. So the one thing that you have to do is you have to go through the contract with a fine tooth comb, find the clauses that stick out to you as problems and go, okay, Mr. Attorney, what's this all about? What happens when this happens? What happens when that happens? That's what you have to do with contracts. I sign contracts probably two to three times a week just in my daily business life. I do review them before I sign them because once I sign them, they're legally binding. In addition to that, I do all the insurance purchasing for our organization, which gets a little complicated for what we do for a living. The other question was architectural plans. Well, every time I've gone to look at a new building for a new site, the first thing I ask for is the plans. I want a site plan, I want a floor plan so I know exactly what I'm looking at and what I'm working with for my operation. I am familiar with those documents and understand how they work. Thank you. Chloe Green. I have about five years of experience reviewing legal documents. I have been the office manager of a car dealership. As far as architectural documents, I currently sit on a board at my church in which we are looking to build a new building. On our land, we are looking to build a $1.5 million facility. I have reviewed the architectural plans and given input on the committee for the beautification of the project. I also, I am the assistant director of an early childhood education center and one of the many things I have done for our building is write and draw fire plans and also emergency entry and exit locations. Thank you all. How much time will you spend studying city council agendas, including public comments and detailed support documentation? Ashley Ward. <coughs> The short answer is as much time as I need to spend to fully understand the issues I'm voting on as well as residents' opinions on those issues. Um, I've been to council meetings or listened to council meetings where residents have provided comments um, and they weren't even discussed and I, I think this needs to change. I think this is a really important thing for members of council to do. They have to understand what they're voting on. Thank you. I can't tell you now how much time I would dedicate to studying each issue that comes before council, but I can assure you that I devote as much time as necessary to be fully abreast. I do it voluntarily now. I am interested and I'm concerned about our community. Um, so I already look at the agenda. I look to see what's going to be presented at a council meeting and then I dive in where I'm interested. 
if it's a proclamation to support childhood cancer, I don't need to spend time and energy on that particular item because that's a no-brainer for me. I automatically support that. However, when you talk about development, that is something where you need to dig deep. You need to look at every sentence. You need to look at the diagrams. There's a development being proposed. I had no idea exactly how close it was going to be uh, to Route 33 until I actually looked at the diagrams. So the devil is in the detail. You do need to pay attention to that. Yeah, I think that reading council agendas and supporting documentation is a core part of the job responsibilities of a council member. Uh, how could I possibly face the voters who put me into office if I told them I didn't do my due diligence in reading all the documentation? And I'll promise you today that I will never vote for something that I do not understand. Thank you. So I'm a little bit of a string puller. When you find a loose thread, you start pulling on it, pulling on it, and pulling on it. I've ruined a couple pairs of shirts like that. They're not pairs, but you know what I'm saying. What I would tell you is, is that as I would go through each and every one of those agendas and documents, I'm going to print them off, and I'm going to go through them page by page, because that's how I look at documents. And I write my notes on them, and then I would take my notes or my string pulls, and I would address them with the appropriate people, whether it be council, whether it be the person proposing it, or whether it be somebody who gives a public comment. If they leave their contact information, follow back up with them and ask, hey, can you tell me a little bit more about this? What's driving this for you? Is there something else that we're missing that we're not understanding? And I think that's important to take that level of attention to detail to it. There's a reason why they prepare those documents. It's so that you walk into that room and you're ready and you know what's going on. And if you haven't done your due diligence and you haven't prepared, then shame on you. It's a lot of reading, just so you know. But the biggest part is it's a lot of research. During meetings, this is your time. Like Patrick indicated, you write a lot of notes. And I will have note after note after note of things that I need to ask. And if I don't get them clarified, then I need to continue to ask. So I will have notes of things that I need to understand because if I'm asking them, odds are either a resident has asked me as well or they're questioning the same thing and just haven't spoken up. It's our job to question it for you so we can get the answers. So you do read through a lot of them. I've read through lots and lots of pages. My husband will attest to my hours spending in front of the computer staring aimlessly going, what? Why? Why? This doesn't make sense. And then you start asking questions and doing your due diligence and finding the resources that are available or reaching out to the city staff and asking the questions. So I'll continue to do so. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I can tell you I'll spend as much time as it takes, which is, again, uh, any meeting uh, is needs to be prepared. I'm a retired <clears throat> and only work part-time at the local Westchester golf course. So I probably have more time than most of the candidates up here because uh, I have, um, uh, my kids are grown and we don't get to have to go to as many soccer games and uh, softball games and everything else. But I think it is essential to uh, prepare your time and <clears throat> prepare yourself going into these meetings so that you're not wasting everybody else's time by asking some of the questions that may have already been answered or may already, <clears throat> excuse me, may already be in the documents that you were prepared or you're supposed to be prepared to uh, talk about. <clears throat> uh, a lot of the required reading is somewhat rehashing some of the old items since you know you have to bring up uh, each subject three times or there's three readings on each subject. But again, I think that in preparing, that is an essential part of our job, understanding what you're reading, understanding your uh, documents that are in front of you. And again, if you do not understand them, then find the person that can explain it to you the best. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the next question will be regarding parking. What will you do to resolve the general parking issues as well as the handicap accessible parking issues of the downtown Canal Winchester area? Jill Amos. This is a hot topic with our community, first of all. We've had lots of conversations at Community Coffee about being pedestrian friendly. Last year we had a pedestrian hit in our crosswalk downtown. 
Um, parking is bad for businesses. We have our jewelry store who a lot of times just has people come in. They just need to run in and they have a, an older clientele. And he says he doesn't have places for people to park and he has to walk out and they have to try to find them or make home deliveries. We have to figure out a better plan. So we actually had this conversation and one of the things we discussed is what are some options? As a city, we've discussed potential signs, but we don't want to clutter our neighborhood. Maybe it's the uh, charity money booths that you have up at Easton. Maybe that's an option to start limiting time. Maybe it's that we expand that parking lot. In the Old Town Plan, there's actually a design for another parking lot in the back. Maybe it's time for us to start looking at that as we have more businesses putting themselves in our downtown area. So we have to start looking at the things that we do have, the opportunities that we do have, and how can we fix it? Because our businesses are losing business when they can't get people in and out quickly, and we need to make sure we take care of them too. Looking at an abandoned building downtown because they couldn't get people in and out of their store is the last thing that we want. We wanna keep our, our shops open and our town beautiful with people flowing in and out, spending money too. Thank you. I think the first thing we need to do is agree that we do or do not have a problem. Um, is parking really an issue for downtown Canal Winchester? And my first reaction would, if you would have asked me this question a few months ago, I would have said, well, I've never had an issue finding a place to park. However, I attended a community coffee and the, the same one that Jill was talking about. I heard a business owner say, um, I conduct mostly transactional business and I'm losing business because my patrons claim they do not have an easy way to get in and out of my business. Some of them are elderly, some of them are handicapped, and they need better options. Um, when we talk about our comprehensive plan, parking should be part of that plan. If we want to attract and retain businesses and get our residents and visitors coming to our downtown area, we need to provide public parking options for them. So when we think about it, and I'm not proposing a, a low rise uh, parking garage, but maybe that is the best option. It uh, takes a smaller footprint. We have very strong architectural standards to make sure that it is aesthetically pleasing. And no, it's not something that we could afford to do in a year or two years, but maybe over time, we create a plan and a funding model that would support a low rise parking garage. Thank you. I will research and explore all the options on reserving the general parking issues that our downtown is facing and then determine which option or options fit this area best, such as exploring maybe shuttle options or possible new parking lot locations. Also talking with the local business owners about the parking issues that they are facing and see if they have any solutions that they might be willing to give me or even visiting neighboring cities downtown areas to decide if there are any other solutions out there that we haven't yet pondered. Yeah, I think part of the problem first off is that it's just a simple numbers issue. Our downtown has stayed relatively the same size. It's slightly grown as with the houses being torn down. We have Waterloo one with local cantina and Waterloo two going in. But generally our population is, you know, tripled over the last uh, 30, 40 years. And the, the amount of parking has remained relatively static. So I kind of agree with Lori, not necessarily on the parking garage, but that I like the idea of thinking of innovative ways to approach it. I think like with so many other things in the city, we need to look at a full slate and range of options to make sure we solve the parking issue, not just today, but looking forward, because this isn't something we wanna revisit every couple, every couple years, we wanna make sure it's something that we have a long-term solution for. And not just regular parking, but the key part of this question was also accessibility. Not just parking for, you know, parking, but making sure that every resident, no matter what kind of disabilities they may have, can access our downtown businesses. And with pedestrian safety, one thing I would like to see is, if you've ever been down Mill Street in Gahanna, they have very well marked pedestrian crossings there, and they have more, not just ones at corners of streets. 
I do think we need to start looking at more pedestrian crossings in areas where you see residents frequently crossing not in crosswalks where local cantina is i think we're seeing like a lot of increased foot traffic across waterloo there maybe put in more pedestrian crossings to help alleviate that and make it safer thank you i think we do need more handicap parking um you know, my dad died of cancer 10 years ago. In the last three years of his life, he had a handicap tag because he was so weak from chemotherapy. And I think that's something that we should consider. It wouldn't be that hard to add some more handicap spots down, downtown. That doesn't solve the problem of parking capacity downtown. Currently, downtown has a limit of two-hour parking. You do have problems with people who work in local businesses parking downtown and staying there for more than two hours. So perhaps we need to have some enforcement mechanism of that two-hour parking and encourage people that work in the residence and on their shift to park in the surface lots that are perhaps behind shades, behind the new town hall. Furthermore, if we can spend $3 million to acquire 45 West Waterloo and another two and a half to $3 million to renovate it to be the new town hall, we can find probably a million dollars somewhere in the budget to buy that nice empty lot that sits behind the old bowling balls. And what we could do there is we could use half of it for parking and turn the other half back into the community garden. Some of you may not remember that, but that was a great asset to the community where people came together and spent time together while they were tending their gardens. And I remember one guy set out a big old like ICB container of water so that people had water to water their crops. So I think that's something that we need to look at. I do believe this one's a little bit more difficult unless we would build a parking garage. Uh, which I wouldn't be in favor of uh, because I think that's kind of a bad option. Uh, I think, don't think it would go with our downtown. But there will be an additional 40 plus parking spaces uh, once the community center moves into the new city hall or city uh, building that we have down there. Also, I think there is plenty of unused parking spaces behind the businesses on West Waterloo. I agree we probably would need some uh, crosswalks for pedestrians to get there because it does go all the way down to Washington Street, but I have never had any problem with finding a place to park downtown during the day, at nighttime, uh, maybe during uh, Labor Day Festival or something like that possibly, but uh, I think that I would have to study though the guidelines because I know all the the parking that's in behind the building there, the city had to follow the state guidelines for handicapped spaces and things of that nature. I would just talk to the individual business owner possibly and see what their thoughts were if there's only one or two business owners saying that they don't have access or their customers do not have access to their stores because I think it is important uh, to all the businesses downtown to have that um, access for their customers to make it as easy as possible to get in there so but again i'd have to review the guidelines for the spaces on the street parking for handicap uh so the old town plan actually did have a plan for additional parking um we we didn't follow it instead we gave a fantastic deal uh, to a developer who put in the new apartment complexes with the retail space underneath, which is a very nice looking um, <coughs> building. I think this is an issue that could be incorporated into our development plan, uh, and then we should follow um, the development plan. And you know, our local businesses, our small local businesses have been vocal that we need additional parking downtown. And I think we owe it to them uh, to listen and address their concerns. Um, businesses like Shaw's Jewelers, which um, has been a part of this community for a long time. Um, my dad remembers them from when he was a kid. Um, and I'm not saying he's old, he's sitting over there, uh, but <laughs> they have been around for a long time. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Dad. <laughs> um, so I can't conjure up parking, right? At this point, I can't just conjure something up, but I think it's something we need to address in the development plan. And I think we need to look for opportunities for additional parking as our downtown changes. Thank you all. And the next question, what is your opinion on using party endorsement in this and future elections? Brandon Horde.
I think that deciding on a partisan endorsement is a really personal issue for each candidate to evaluate themselves. For me, I chose not to accept a partisan nomination or endorsement from, or sorry, not nomination, we're a nonpartisan election, but I did not accept an endorsement from Democrat Party, the Republican Party, or a third party. Um, for me, Canal Winchester residents have made it clear that we have a proud tradition here of nonpartisan elections. As a, as a newer resident, I felt empowered that I could run just as Brandon Horde, accountable to all voters and not accountable to a party. So for me, I chose not to seek an endorsement because the only master I want to have is the voters. Thank you. Thank you, this will be quick. I am a registered Republican, however, I chose to respect and honor the fact that this is a nonpartisan office. I want to represent all people on the local issues and therefore I chose not to accept any uh, form of a party level endorsement. So I'm a Republican raised by an Irish Catholic Democrat from Chicago. That being, that being said, I took the endorsement. I have no problems with it. Does it going to affect the way that I do my job if I'm elected to council? Absolutely not. I have friends who are Democrats. I have friends who are Green parties. One of my best friends painted his barn for Obama twice. Just because you choose to think about politics at a national level differently than I do doesn't mean that I'm going to disagree with you as a person. All of us are made in the image and likeness of God and are worthy of that dignity and respect. So I have no problems taking a Republican Party endorsement. Thank you. I am not opposed to party endorsements, but I also understand it's important for candidates to run their own race and not rely on parties to do the work for them. That's why I've been out meeting with voters to connect with them on issues rather, rather than parties. What does the word endorsement mean? It means the act of giving one's public approval or support to something or someone. This is exactly what we're all trying to do when we go out and knock on doors to get to, to when we campaign and get people to vote for us. We're trying to get the individual endorsements. It is legal and we do have freedom of speech. Everyone had the same opportunity for endorsements, so there wasn't any advantage or disadvantage. Uh, they contacted us versus us contacting them and I did accept the, the Republican Party endorsement also. Uh, I think it is naive of some people in today's political climate uh, to think that people are, do not care if you lean more or if you're more conservative or more liberal. Uh, and I understand that the election in Canal Winchester is a nonpartisan <clears throat> uh, election, which is the way it should be here in Canal Winchester. But again, like Patrick said, even though I accepted the endorsement, I feel that that has nothing to do once if we are elected, uh, you have each issue on its own merit in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party has no say in that. Um, so I have no problem with uh, using the party endorsement today or in the future. I think at best, it's inappropriate. Canal Winchester has chosen for our council election to be nonpartisan. And I have to say, I resent any party or candidate who brings partisanship into our election. And there's a reason that we've chosen for our council members to be nonpartisan. And that's because the issues that council members vote on have nothing to do with partisan politics. Things like zoning, annexation, <laughs> safety, DORA. So why would a candidate seek partisan endorsement? The answer, of course, is to win and to win primarily based on that R or the D by their name, not their position on local issues, integrity, experience, which should be the focus, but that R or the D. And I don't think that's what's best for Canal Winchester. It distracts from real local issues. It distorts the fair election process. And partisan politics at the national level, it's toxic and it's divisive. 
And I hate that. And I hate that it's unnecessarily being forced into our local election. Ironically, I got the same note that some of them did, asking if I wanted the endorsement, and I threw it away. I put it in my recycling bin, and that's where it stayed. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, when you get an endorsement, the party that you get endorsed by will actually send out a slate card for you, therefore spending money on your program, sending it out to everybody in your party, giving you, in my opinion, an unfair advantage. When our charter did a review this past year that you as residents will be voting on, the majority of our charter review members ask that it be put in there that this be a nonpartisan election. We went round and round. Our community spoke up loud. People called. People said, let's keep it neutral. Ashley's right. If I vote to increase your water, if I vote to say yes to human services getting money for a bus, it has nothing to do with my political affiliation. I put it in the recycle bin. And that's where it stayed for a reason. In a nonpartisan election, I want to win because I deserve to win and because I want to represent you on what I've done. Thank you. OK, uh, thank you. And many of you have answered this next question. So we will, um, it is, are you being endorsed by anyone? If so, who and why did you accept the endorsement? Does anyone have anything to add to this topic, or can we move on to the next question? I don't like that. OK, then we'll go, th we'll go through everyone to keep it fair. So Patrick Shea, uh, you will be first up. Are you being endorsed by anyone? If so, who and why did you accept the endorsement? Yes, but we have one candidate that would like to answer. <laughs> so yeah was endorsed by the Republican Party. My dad's probably rolling over in his grave. My aunt's giving me hell about it, but there's nothing I can really do about it because I chose to do it and I'm gonna stand behind it. That being said, there is another group that's out there endorsing candidates and no one's talking about it because they're not a political party, but they have come out very hard and very strong for four particular candidates, one of whom, no offense, Ms. Amos, you're on council, you're an incumbent, you have a record, has voted for all four of the warehouses that went in, and as we got close to election time, decided to change her vote with the political wins. Thank you. So I have been endorsed by the Franklin County Republican Party. Although the race itself is nonpartisan, I've met with Democrats, Independents, Republicans, and learned that we can all connect on issues. So while I get why endorsements may be frowned upon, I thought it was important to demonstrate my ability to gain the support of groups who have been out there working hard for our community long before I decided to enter politics. The endorsement I'm looking forward to the most is from the voters on November 2nd, voting Chloe Green for Canal Winchester City Council. Thank you. I have received an official and documented endorsement from Dr. Michelle Reynolds, who serves as our Madison Township trustee. And part of the question is, why did you um, accept that nomination? I respect Michelle very much, and we need to be partners with Madison Township. Many of the services that they provide support our residents and our neighbors. And so, again, I uh, hold her in the highest esteem, and I very much gladly accept her actual endorsement of me as a candidate for city council. Thank you. Uh, I have not been formally endorsed um, by any uh, particular uh, party. Um, my talk earlier probably gave you that inclination. Um, however, there are some local groups, um, local Facebook groups that have really rallied behind me and three of the other candidates uh, based on our positions on local issues and our integrity. Uh, those two groups are Canal Winchester for Responsible Growth and Canal Winchester for Smart Growth, Smart Growth and Responsible Growth. 
Um, they are nonpartisan, and they're both on Facebook if anybody wants to look them up to learn more about who they are or what they stand for. I, too, did not seek an endorsement. I am endorsed by my community, which is really all that matters to me. Mr. Shea mentioned about the warehouse. One thing Mr. Shea should learn is there's a game of politics that goes on when you're elected. And sometimes when you know you're going to lose a vote, it's all about negotiations. So the trees that Brandon lost, I asked for the $140,000 to be reappropriated into the tree fund instead of the general fund because that's where it needed to be. So sometimes your yes vote isn't because you want to. It's because you're trying to get the best out of the worst situation. So I am on the record, sort of. The, I, I don't know how well a Facebook group can endorse you, but I appreciate their support. Thank you. I also did not seek any endorsement, unfortunately, or fortunately enough, I guess. They asked us if we would like to be endorsed, and so I said yes after talking to them. I don't think that uh, being endorsed uh, by a lot of people is a bad thing. Uh, I think it's just one more tool in the uh, toolbox, if you will. Uh, the reason that I did accept it was because <clears throat> I would like to win the election uh, so I can serve the residents of my hometown of Canal Winchester, which is the, why I decided to enter the race uh, to begin with. I don't think that being endorsed by any party or any Facebook group uh, is going to make a big difference once you get elected and serve on the council uh, because again a lot of the um, issues that you are voting on has not a, a political affiliate anyway so again I did accept the Republican Party but I did not seek it so Brandon well I did not accept the or seek a partisan endorsement I did I do accept the support from Canal Winchester for Responsible Growth, which is a page run by Pat and Cindy Lynch and Bethany Ferguson, who is in this room as well. And for Canal Winchester for Smart Growth, which originated as a Facebook group, but as every council member in this room can attest, has very quickly moved into the physical realm. Um, I, I believe that there is a distinction between political parties and grassroots organizations composed of residents in the community. For me, there's a distinction there that I feel more comfortable accepting the support of those completely local groups, whereas the Franklin County parties, less than 1% of Franklin County's population is in Canal Winchester. So it's not primarily a Canal Winchester mm -hmm. group. So that's how I kind of felt about that issue and why I was comfortable accepting those. But the most important endorsement for me was actually on day one when I asked my wife if she would support me running and she signed off on my run. So that was my number one endorsement. Thanks, babe. All right, thank you. Uh, next question. How has your career readied you for working on the city council and what do you uniquely offer? Chloe Green. <coughs> it's no secret that I am 20 years old and it's been brought up a lot of times online I've seen but I would be one of if not the youngest person to sit on Canal Winchester City Council but aside from being an early childhood education instructor a licensed minister and even a small business owner I can be a fresh voice for the city and encourage others just like me to see that they can get involved and have a stake in where Canal Winchester is headed. Just like Brandon said earlier, there is a younger population in Canal Winchester and we need to have a voice on the council and we need to have a voice in our city to speak up for the things that we would like to see. Canal Winchester is a great city and it's heading in an amazing direction, but we have to include all ages, races, everyone needs to be included in our city council. And I hope that you will vote for me this up and coming election. Uh, to start with, I have two degrees from The Ohio State University. Go Buckeyes. I earned my first degree in environmental science in 2008 and my second degree in chemical engineering in 2012. I have worked for the state of Ohio for the past nine years, and I currently manage an engineering program and team of scientists and engineers. 
For the first four years of my career as a public servant, I worked as an engineer. And so one thing I bring to the table is a strong technical background and experience working with business leaders, local governments, attorneys, and technical experts. For the past five years, I've been in management. And during that time, I have learned so much about leadership. I've learned how to operate under budgetary and resource constraints. I've learned how to make processes more efficient. I have learned change management, time management, and workload planning. I've also learned the importance of vision for my team. But the most important thing I've learned is how to listen. And I don't mean listening to words, meanwhile, my mind has already been made up. I mean really hearing people and understanding others' perspectives. Thank you. So I talked about this earlier, but I think one of the biggest, most unique things I bring is the fact that I come from a compliance and audit and risk background, so or professional background at least. So I'll be able to bring an objective set of eyes to any issue council faces, because in audit, that's important. Uh, you have to be able to look at all sides of complex issues research them and make sure you aren't letting your personal opinion come in and doing what's truly best for the community. Also, I have a bachelor's degree in history and political science from Bowling Green State University, a master's in policy history from Bowling Green, and I'm a published local history author. So I have a very healthy respect for local history and the context that got us to where we were today. So you can always count on me to have a healthy respect for uh, the history of the community and to make sure that any changes we enact are carefully considered within respect for that history. So yeah, I think ultimately just bringing that fresh auditor's perspective, that watchdog mentality, that I'll look at our finances. I'll, I also write policies, procedures, and regulations. So we are a lawmaking body. So I have the expertise to be able to write resolutions, edit zoning, update zoning codes as needed and to contribute to that process with legal counsel and to be a part of that. So I do think that is a unique perspective I bring. Thanks. I want to start real quick by saying to Chloe, I admire your courage, young girl. and. Uh, so thank you for putting your name into this race. So one of the things that I think that brings me a unique uh, opportunity as a council member is that I bring with it tons of business experience. Um, I've been at this game for a long time. I've been involved in budget and forecast development and management for years. And for those of you that have done that, you know that's a hair pulling um, exercise. Risk analysis, evaluation and execution of initiatives and projects. I've been involved in RFP, RFI, RFQ development for many, many years, contract development and execution. And then most importantly, I've been involved in people management for decades. And you can't get work done without people. And that's why I'm asking for your vote on November 2nd, because I want us to work together. Well, I also have real life experience over my 70 years. <clears throat> uh, I've been married for 50 years, and that alone qualifies me for a lot of uh, jobs. Uh, there is a lot of give and take in 50 years and making it work. Uh, I have served in several management positions over my uh, business career. Uh, I've held uh, responsibility for at least 125 people plus. Uh, I've had uh, multi-million dollar budgets underneath me. Uh, I've been a small business owner twice. Uh, <clears throat> I've been the past president of both our church council and our early learning center at but, uh, Resurrection Evangelical Lutheran Church in Hilliard. Uh, I was born and raised here, uh, which is probably unique. Uh, I graduated from high school at Canal Winchester back in 1969, which again makes me kind of unique, I guess. Uh, plus visiting over the years gives me a historical perspective and some of the things that have happened over the past years. Um, I have also been on the um, uh, Charter Review Committee Commission that was uh, brought up earlier and also served on the Labor Day Committee. Uh, so when growing up, uh, I wanted to pay it back because the Canal Winchester was extremely, extremely good to my family 
uh, in our situation growing up here in a small community, and I just want to pay it back. Uh, so that is one of the reasons that I am running, too. So. I work for a school district, so there's not a lot of crossover, but I will say one of the key things that I do is I am responsible for all the policies that get written in our district, which means I have to review the Sunshine Law, the Ohio Revised Code, the Ohio, the OAC, the ORC. I also have to review the Supreme Court listings that come out and all the things that are associated with that. I actually have my semi-annual going on right now, which is, for me, they love contracts. I love policy, so I'm not going to lie. I sit and scour through every part of it and check every single code on it. Um, but the biggest thing I think I bring for me, because I think you can learn a lot of things as you go along and become better at them, for me the biggest part is customer service. It's about listening. You have to listen in this job. You have to make yourself available. You have to be willing to have the hard conversations even when you don't agree. Like you have to be able to understand where they're coming from, see them where they are, and understand the reasoning behind it. Because sometimes when people give you their opinion, you don't understand behind it. You're never going to understand where they're coming from. But if you take the time and listen and use your customer service background, then you'll be able to understand where they're coming from, which just adds another little special piece into the puzzle. And that's how we create a better city, is by bringing all of these pieces of the puzzle together. Thank you. I've been blessed to have a really storybook career. My partner and I started our business 16 years ago in a conference room, and today we have four locations across two states with 18 employees. That's something I'm very proud of. Uh, that experience of building a business, making decisions, hiring people, training people, communicating with people, taking care of our customers, solving their problems, having the difficult conversations when it comes down to you know, I'm sorry, I know you want that, Mr. Customer, but unfortunately, it's not a reality that we can put forth for you now. Here's the solutions that we can give you. Are any of these options acceptable to you? That is my experience. In addition to that, I'm the only candidate on this table or stage that has actually built a commercial property inside the city of Canal Winchester. I'm familiar with the development process. I've worked with the development department, and I've also worked with the plans review department. I think that gives me a little bit of a different perspective than some of the other folks that are sitting up here, and it's a unique value add that I can offer to it. In addition to that, people have mentioned their education. My bachelor's is from Ohio University. My master's is from Wright State. It's in logistics and supply chain management. Supply chain management is simply planning and then planning for the unexpected and having contingencies ready to go and solving problems on the fly. That's something that I excel at, and if I'm elected to council, I will bring that to council. Thank you. Thank you all. In what areas can you specifically help to improve our city? Lori Amick. Thank you. First of all, I want it to be known that I am 150% behind the development of a long-term plan. I really feel um, very convicted on that particular topic, and here's why. In the, in the years that I've been involved in watching council, watching city leaders, et cetera, I am starting to see more and more discord. We have council members who cannot get on the same page. We have council and planning and zoning that can't get on the same page. We have city leaders and council that can't get on the same page because there's no sheet of music from which to work with. So I'm 150% behind the development of a long-term, excuse me, and comprehensive plan. When I talk with residents, the second thing I want to highlight is when I talk with residents, I am amazed at how they feel about communication. And they constantly tell me that they think that the communication is poor. I said, well, don't you read the newsletter? It's got some good information in it. And they said, and I never thought of this, they said, we live in a condo association. We don't get a newsletter. And then another resident in that community said, well, did you know you can get it online? And they're like, I didn't know that. So simple things like that. We need to do better at communicating and getting the word out. 
<clears throat> and thirdly, I want to support, I want to see us support more downtown business development. Um, my daughter Haley, who is here with me tonight, um, sorry, I'll come back to that. Thank you. I also agree with Lori that one of the most important things I can do to improve this city is contributing in a meaningful way to the comprehensive planning process that really does touch on every aspect of our community. And Canal Winchester is at a crossroads, and I think it's really important that we get this planning process right. So that's one of the things I definitely am committed to, to, to being heavily involved with. But a, another thing I think I bring to the table is I've always been a, a pretty diplomatic individual. I'm a collaborator. I'm the person in the group that likes to hear everybody speak and then speak and kind of try to figure out ways that both sides can come together. And we're at a period right now where there is a lot of division nationally and increasingly in Canal Winchester. I think one way I can contribute is by bringing that dynamic that I will objectively, as a historian trained, listen to both sides of a particular issue and try to find a path forward that is amenable to all parties involved. And acknowledging that that won't always be possible but the, the spirit of compromise is useful in many cases, and that there's more common ground between us than we think if we would take the time to listen to each other and engage with each other. So I think that perspective is something I'll bring to help improve that discourse and communication we talked about in the city. Thanks. Uh, so two specific areas uh, that I think would be good for me to focus on would be um, engineering issues and also financial issues, which both of which I have experience in. Um, and one thing that I would bring to improve the city is a new independent voice. Um, I think we desperately need uh, to get some strong voices in uh, to provide independence and also fresh ideas. And then I talked earlier about how one of the biggest things I've learned from being a manager is to listen. So I agree with Brandon that that is another really important issue and something I also would bring. Thank you. So I love projects. You can ask my husband. It's probably the understatement of the world and half people in this crowd are probably shooting daggers at me because they're on different committees with me. Um, but as a council person, I'm not done yet. I feel like we still have more to do. For the past two months, there's been a large group of residents, downtown businesses, and shops that have been working on getting DORA and information for the DORA in the hopes that we can push this along. We've been meeting with the restaurants, with the residents. We want to continue the success of that. Just some of the examples of projects that we started since the, I started on council. We have the hands-free wireless, which is now a first offense in Canal Winchester. We have curbside recycling. For those of you who aren't familiar, three kids showed up to Community Coffee and said, why aren't we recycling? And from there, we worked with those kids, the city and the school, and every, like twice a month, we would stand out there and sort people's recycling for over a year to show that curbside recycling was necessary in our community. These are the kinds of projects that we have to delve into, but you have to see them to fruition. We have strong residential standards because of the work that some of the council members did along with Lucas. These are the things we have to continue to do. I'm not done yet. I hope to continue my community coffees because I feel like it's very important for residents to have an outlet to come talk to somebody. And the amount of things that we have shared and the great conversation that have come out of them have been impeccable. So thank you. So first off, Jill, thanks for the recycling because I like my recycling bin. Uh, second off, if I'm elected, I'll, if you'll have me, I'll join you at your community coffee. I think that's a wonderful Absolutely. program you run. I really do. Uh, what would I bring? I'm a guy who believes the devil's in the details. And I'm a guy who likes to drill down. When someone gives me an answer and it's kind of mm, wishy-washy, there's going to be a follow-up question. And that's one thing that I think I will bring to council that I think we're lacking especially when we're talking about council's relationship with the city administration. Every time those city reports are submitted, 
and they've got the finance director's report and the city uh, utilities director's report and the development director's report. I never see a question asked about any of those reports in a council meeting. And I promise you, if I read through those reports and I see something that sticks out at me, I will be asking a question and drilling down on that to make sure that we get the answers and more transparency that I think a lot of us are looking for from our city government. Thank you. Chuck Carpenter. In what areas can you specifically help improve our city? I think the number one for me, <clears throat> just because of my sports background, I know I can help with the CWJRD organization and make a difference there because I think that organization, unfortunately, does need a lot of help, and I think that um, that one can be turned around uh, with a lot of help from the community and uh, the council in the city. Uh, I would also <clears throat> get out and listen and see what the residents has to say to take into consideration uh, in the decision-making process for the uh, um, community development plan. I think that's a very worthwhile project. It's not going to be done overnight. It is going to take a while. I mean, it could take up to a year to ha develop that plan. So I think there's going to be a lot of talk, a lot of listening, a lot of meetings, and I think that's uh, another area that I can help. I will get out and uh, continue to work for the DORA because I think that's a very good, uh, agent, a very good uh, project for the downtown um, area and I'll uh, try to explore the cost of implementing that because I'm sure that there is a cost implementing the DORA project, project but also then push to make uh, sure that it makes sense for the whole community and not just for the downtown. Uh, and then I would continue to work toward that safety study that we've a lot of us have talked about not only for the police but also for emergency and um, just in general getting our money's worth from the Madison Township uh, people. Green. <laughs> Safety and security of the residents of Canal Winchester will be one of my top priorities. Improving services for our youth, early childhood development, and community engagement will all be issues that I will be focusing on and working on daily. Okay, thank you all, and we're, we're almost there. <laughs> um, what are your top three reasons for running for Canal Winchester City Council? And we'll start with Patrick Shea. I love this town. Canal Winchester is a great town. Um, I've been accepted everywhere I've gone in this town, whether it's a church that wasn't my home church and I find these church ladies that do more service with their little pinky than I've seen done anywhere else in my entire life. I, that is one of my main reasons that I'm running. I love this town. I want to keep it nice. I want to protect our downtown area. I like walking downtown and seeing people at the establishments and the restaurants and enjoying that small town feel and that sense of community where people get together. I mean, I don't know if you guys know this, I met Brandon Horde at a local cantina. That was the first time I met him and Amy and we had a great conversation. Those are the kinds of things that make this town nice. I want to keep that small town charm as we sit here in Franklin County in the 13th largest metropolitan area with Columbus, Ohio right there. Keep this small town charm. That is something that is absolutely important to me. On the other side is, is we can't forego additional revenue streams to keep up our level of city services that residents have come to expect in this town. This town has great city services. I don't know about the rest of you, but if you've ever driven in another city after it snows, it's an absolute disaster. I hope you have four-wheel drive because if you live in the city of Columbus, you're gonna need it. But here in Canal Winchester, it doesn't work that way. Our city, our city streets department is out there plowing those roads, getting them clear so those kids can get to school the next day. So I just wanna say, I love Canal Winchester. That's why I'm running. Safety and security of the residents of Canal Winchester, I'll say it again because that is the one thing that I know to be an issue and a need for our community to have, is safety and security. You want to feel safe when you enter your home. You want to feel safe when you're out walking your dog. You want to feel safe when you're walking your kids to the park. 
You just want to feel safe. And that's one of the reasons that I am running for Canal Winchester City Council. Also, making sure that our tax dollars are being spent wisely and in the right places and they're going to the right programs that are needed to help our youth and other organizations and other businesses that are in our um, city. Also, to incentivize smart business development and to look, think outside the box. Think about your kids. I heard once upon a time there was a bowling alley in Canal Winchester. I had never heard of that. And residents started telling me, oh yeah, the old bowling alley we used to hang out. I went, what? There was a bowling alley in Canal Winchester? I know I'm 20 years old, but <laughs> I haven't lived in Canal Winchester all my life, but a bowling alley sounds nice. That's a place where I feel like youth and young people, they could congregate there. They could go there and say, this is our town thing. This is our young thing. This is the place that we go. When students graduate high school, they grow up and they don't return to Canal Winchester because they find that there's nothing for them to do here. Imagine if we had something that was enticing them, inviting them to want to stay in Canal Winchester because Canal Winchester is made up of lifelong residents, residents who've been here forever. We need to keep our youth in Canal Winchester. Thank you. This is really easy for me. Um, Canal Winchester is my home. It has been my home for 20 some years. My husband Craig and I, we chose to live here. We weren't born here. Our parents didn't live here. We chose to live here. And so why would I want anything less than a beautiful city for myself and my husband. My daughter, she's moved away and I said, well, please come back. And she's like, I need more in Canal Winchester. There isn't enough for me there. And so um, the second thing I wanna say about why I chose to run is I'm not afraid of a little hard work. And as a matter of fact, I've been um, driven my entire life, my entire career. My husband's rolling his eyes because he knows how much I, I like to drive things. Um, I'm not afraid of hard work. Serving 9,200 9, residents roughly is hard work. Making sure that you hear their voices, making sure that you understand the issues, making sure that you're doing your due diligence. The taxpayers of this town expect nothing less. I'm only allowed to pick three reasons. Okay, well, I'll narrow it down. One, I said I'm project driven. I want to see this 20 year comprehensive plan and I want to see it through. There's a lot of pieces that I can bring from the last four years that I think we need to look at. There's a lot of pieces of that puzzle that we need to put together and I want to make sure that we are including the diverse amount of people in our community to make sure that we're getting it right because if you're only doing this every 10 to 20 years, we need to get it right. We need to make sure we're thinking clearly. I'm not done. I'm, I'll be openly honest in telling you my opinions with city and staff and some of my fellow council members are not always popular. I'm not gonna lie. I ask the hard questions. I challenge some of the answers. That's what we're here to do. We're here to represent people, not to just stand by and sometimes let them walk all over you. And I wanna continue engaging the residents. That is, again, and I will say it a million times, that's why you're here. It's not the money. You get paid a paycheck, but it's not the money that you choose to run. It's because you feel strongly about making a difference in your community and standing up for the residents because that way they have a voice. I sat in a meeting five years ago and I watched a, a building get built and I kept thinking, they're not asking the questions. They're not asking the right questions. Why aren't they asking this? What about this? And nobody asked. So now I have the chance to ask, and I take advantage of it. Thank you. So I just wanted to talk briefly about the personal reasons why I ran. We've spent a lot, two hours here talking about the issues, so I'm going to kind of talk about personal reasons. The first one was that I've always had a heart for public service. My dad was in the military, both my grandpa served in World War II, and my older brother was in the military. I would be in the military if I didn't have a heart condition that disqualified me, which was probably fortunate because I met my wife. But, um, but besides that, but this is another way for me to serve the public. I have such a healthy respect for our country's history, and our, our, our country was made great by people stepping up a higher call to serve the community. I want to be a part of that. I want to serve 
all of you and do the best I can to create a better future for everyone in this room and in the community. I also wanted to be a voice for newer residents. I feel like certain parts of the city are still in sort of a village mentality run by a small club. I feel like it's important to have a voice on city council that is a newer resident that will bring an out, a fresh perspective to the city to make sure that we are operating as a professional city. And the third reason is I was hoping if even one young person, of course, Chloe's younger than me, Ashley's also young, but if, if we can inspire, if I'll add them in, you inspire young people to get involved in Canal Winchester, I think that'll be a huge success for all three of us, for other people our age to see, look, we're, you know, this is our future too. We need to be a part in building it. So those were the three reasons why I'm running. Thanks. I think I'm older than you, Brandon. <laughs> uh, I'm actually 36 years old. Um, so just, oh, only three years. Um, so Canal Winchester is a great place to live, and I want to make sure that it stays that way. Uh, there are actually currently four generations of my family living in Canal Winchester. Um, and we've spent a lot of time tonight talking about the different issues. So as I look down at my, my notes for this question, um, I realize that we've already discussed a lot of it. Um, so I'm just going to kind of briefly summarize. My first reason is that I want to advocate for smart growth. And my second reason is safety, which is a lot of our reasons. Uh, we want to see safety improved. And then my third reason is transparency and integrity. I believe the city needs to do a better job of listening to its residents. Um, and I, I've said this before, but I think it's really important, so I am going to close with it, and that is that I am funding my campaign myself. I think it is so important to be independent um, and not owe anybody any favors. Again, my vote will belong to the Canal Winchester residents. Thank you. Well, I don't belong in the young group, I can tell you that. <clears throat> in fact, I used to bowl at the bowling alley. <laughs> that was here in Canal Winchester, and I'm not sure how long ago that closed, but uh, it's been some time ago. Uh, so uh, I want to pay back the city for growing up here in Canal Winchester. Again, I stated that earlier. Um, I grew up here in Canal Winchester. Um, with some other people here in Canal Winchester, and <clears throat> I think it is a great place. It was a great place, and it's been a great place, and I want to make sure that it continues to be a great place. Some people said I'm kind of crazy because I'm, again, retired, uh, work part-time at a golf course. So that means I get free golf, so I can golf anytime I want, and they're saying, well, why do you want to get involved? And again, I want to get involved to make sure that the difference is that are in our community now get resolved in that community divide gets uh, either a little bit closer and we're working together in the same direction. Uh, also, I do want to support that business development program because I think that will give us a, a road map to where we want to be in 10, 15, 20 years. And again, to make sure that that continues to be updated and not, we're not just doing it every 10 years. So those are the three reasons. Okay, that concludes our planned questions, but the candidates are going to get a chance to speak again. I'll ask our timekeepers how much time can we allow. That's almost nine. Is We're it? Good at the 90 seconds. 90 seconds? 90 seconds. Okay. Extremely <laughs> <laughs> okay. You guys have been real. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, before we move on, though, I do want to uh, thank Denise Mathias. Um, she runs our Canal Winchester Chamber of Commerce, and she planned all this. She did a great job. And I want to thank Kristen Ancrum for being our timekeeper tonight. She's done a great job. And Crowd Communications, they were a great help in planning all this as well. So I'm going to keep this simple, and we'll just start on this end, 90 seconds with Chloe, and we'll just move down the line. So... Yes, I've been talking with you guys. I am Chloe Green, and I'm running to represent you, the people of Canal Winchester. I'm not a career politician. This is my first race, and I understand that the voters elect me. 
I won't forget that. Even if I am elected to a council, I will not forget that the voters have chosen me to sit on council, so I have to represent them to the best of my ability and at least take time out of my day to listen to what they have to say and to take into account and when I'm voting on issues or I'm looking at issues to understand that the public, they're the ones who hold all the power. power. They're the ones who elect the people that are sitting up here. I ask that you remember to vote for me on November 2nd, Chloe Green, but I also ask that you take the time to get to know each candidate. Don't just vote for a candidate because of an endorsement or a party or because of who their mom is or dad is or if they sit on <coughs> council already. I ask that you take time, go out for coffee, get a hold of the candidates that are currently running because if you get a hold of them now, you get to understand and start to build those relationships that you will need when they are actually on council. So whether I'm elected or not, I ask that you take time to get to know me. I'll be around tonight so that you can actually talk to me and you can ask me any questions that you want and I'll be willing to answer them. I plan on having full transparency with you. I'm not going to hide anything because I don't have anything to hide. And I ask that you still vote for Chloe Green on November 2nd. Thank you. First off, I just once again wanted to thank uh, the candidates. I wanted to thank all of you for coming out. And I wanted to thank the Chamber of Commerce for putting on such a great event. It's run so smoothly. And thank you to BrewDog for providing this excellent space. I do hope that you will consider voting for me as one of your choices on November 2nd. I think that I can bring a unique perspective that other candidates don't bring. One thing I wanted to talk about that I didn't get a chance to earlier is one of the biggest things I do at my work is I'm an anti-money laundering, anti-fraud um, risk officer. So what I do is I dig into transactions, I dig into financials. I believe it is extreme, I'm not saying there's any money laundering going on in Canal Winchester, by the way, but what I'm saying is that from day one, I will dive deep into our finances. I'm sure our finance director will get sick of me, but I think it's important for city council to be a good steward of the city's finances, to spend them responsibly, and so I will be heavily involved in that process to make sure that taxpayer money is spent wisely. Um, there are nice to haves like the McDormand building, which we, but there are many need to haves that perhaps we should have focused on first. So one thing if you vote for me you can count on is that I'll be a strong watchdog of our finances, get into the grit and make sure that the residents understand what's going on in the city's finances and that we are being good stewards of that money. Thank you. So we have spent a lot of time tonight talking about the different issues. So I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about myself as a person so you can get to know me just a little bit better. Uh, so I am a mom of three beautiful children, um, aged two, aged seven and nine. Um, I am also a dog mom and a cat mom. Uh, my husband and I have three dogs, two large rescues, and then one Lassipu. So the Lassipu was my husband's dog. Um, when we first met, I had a large, maybe 70 pound dog. Um, and when I first went to his house, he came out walking with a Yorkshire Terrier and his Lassipu, and they were both wearing outfits. Um, <laughs> so uh, my husband is absolutely wonderful. He is so supportive as I'm out trying to save the world. Um, and then an interesting fact about me is I am scuba certified. So on my downtime, my husband and I like to take our kids hiking and traveling, and um, my husband and I like to go scuba diving. And I am going to close on a high note with that. Thank you. Again, <clears throat> my name is Chuck Carpenter, and I would appreciate anyone in here that would uh, vote for me on November 2nd, uh, whether you endorse me or don't endorse me, I guess. Uh, we have talked a lot about the issues. We've shown you the differences. But I will say that all seven of us are sincere about running for the council and doing the best job that we can for the residents of Canal Winchester. There's no doubt in my mind, even with the differences that we do have, that we all will try to do the best job that we can for you, the residents. I would also uh, 
let you know that I am so certified scuba diving, but my scuba diving days are behind me at, as of right now. So, <clears throat> uh, but it is a lot of fun. So, uh, again, Chuck Carpenter, and I would appreciate your vote on November second. I, like Ashley, figured I probably talked enough already, so I was going to tell you a little bit about myself. I am the mother of four boys. Um, they are 23. I have a set of twins that are 21, and then I have my baby who is 16 and towers over me at close to six feet. But he's still my baby, even though he doesn't like to think so. That's my incredible husband out there, and just like Brandon, he was the first one to sign my petition so that I could make sure I had his full support. I wasn't twisting his arm or making him hold the pen. Just kidding. <laughs> He's my biggest fan. Um, I am an Eagle Scout advisor, and so I work with a lot of Eagle Scouts in our community trying to create future leaders that will carry on the Eagle Scout world, but also um, developing leaders in our community that have done big projects all throughout. I love to serve on different committees throughout our town, and I love to be involved. So you've probably seen, I think there's a good chunk of you out here in the crowd that I've worked on committees with or seen you at events. And I just absolutely thank you for all your support. And side note, Chuck did tell me if he didn't get elected, he was still volunteering for the JRD. So <laughs> I'm very thankful for people like that who are willing to commit to our kids. So um, I do appreciate you being here tonight. I appreciate everybody for putting this on, all of the community out there, hello. And um, yeah, I'd appreciate your vote this year so I can continue doing what we're doing. Thank you. I want to once again thank the Chamber for hosting tonight's event. Um, I want to thank my, the many friends and neighbors. Um, you are near and dear to my heart. I listen to you. Um, I can't wait for our follow-up fire pit discussion coming soon, I'm sure. And uh, so I just want to thank you. But most importantly, I want to thank my husband and my daughter, Haley. Um, unlike Brandon, when he said his, his wife was his immediate supporter, I had to convince my husband a little bit. Um, he, he sees and he hears and he talks to people and he said, are you sure you want to do that? So thank you, honey, for supporting me. Um, I am also a mother of two. Again, I mentioned my daughter Haley. I have a late daughter in heaven and I miss her terribly. Um, but I raised both of my daughters here and I love this city. There isn't anything bad about Canal Winchester. We just need to move and evolve and carry on as our population grows and our needs change. So I'm actually asking for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, Chamber, for having us. Thank you, Mrs. Ankrum, for being the timer. To the gentleman in the back running the camera, thanks for broadcasting this. Evidently, there are actually people watching it tonight, so thank you for that. And all of you guys that took your Monday night to come out here and listen to seven very qualified people discuss their opinions on the issues that are facing our town, thanks for being here. Thanks for caring about this town. It's a great town. And since everybody's going sidebars about themselves, I have two daughters. They are uh, 14 and 12. They go to school here in Canal Winchester. Uh, my youngest play, or my oldest plays soccer for the uh, junior varsity team, and she's really excited and having fun with that. She actually plays with Mrs. Ankrum's daughter. Um, I would like to say we have an opportunity to elect whoever we want. This is the beauty of American democracy. Um, there are seven people up here for four spots. Take your time, get to know us. Ask us what you want to know. And uh, if you find something that you like, Stick with it and vote for it. If you find something that you don't like, keep looking until you find something that works better with what you're looking for. Pragmatism solves a lot of problems. Absolutism drives us into division and into areas of conflict. There's always a middle road and there's always a way to compromise. On November 2nd, I'd love to have your vote. Thank you. The candidates did a great job. Thank you all. So, election day is November 2nd. There are four seats available. Uh, good luck to all of you, and thank you for being here. Thank you.